Hi, everybody. My name is Michael DeBar, and we're on Reality Check Television. I highly recommend you rock and roll with it. Reality Check viewers, it is a genuine pleasure to be sitting next to this young man right here, Michael DeBar. Of well, I first learned of uh, learned of this man by his very first band, Detective, which was opened up. What, they opened up for Kiss in 1977. I was there, way up in the nosebleeds, and I just remember thinking, "Wow, that's a great bluesy rock band," you know. And then it just didn't really seem to go much Let's further. Let's start with that one. Shut the fuck up about that. Why <laughs> <laughs> would you open an interview? Is that didn't really happen? What are you, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> no, sir. First of all, it was Silverhead is the first band. Oh, Silverhead was the first Detective band. Detective was spectacular. But Loved through it. Narcotics and through Jimmy Page not coming and producing our album and oh. leaving us in Los Angeles with a million dollars each, and we were 25, uh, many things mm -hmm. occurred. Um, in terms of sales mm. uh, of that album, there was no um, promotion to the record yeah, because Zeppelin, cool. when you've got a label, your own label, yeah. it's a vanity project sure. and you need a, a label to work that record. What is Bonzo going to promote? I know, you right? Know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> only, you know, a quarter of me was owned by Bonzo. So, yeah. you know, it was a very difficult and wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. But I've never really thought that any of the bands I've been in have been stratospherically popular. But uh, that was never my uh, goal. My goal was to play. I just yeah. wanted to fucking play music. <laughs> Other favorite band of yours was yeah. Checkered Past. Yeah, that was a really cool lineup. How, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Band. Well, st I love the Pistols, and I um, I went to see the Pistols this here in San Francisco. Oh, you went, you were at that show? Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And and Steve and I had known each other for a while uh -huh. before, um, but it it really woke me up in a sense. Uh -huh. That music woke me up. Mm. Um, it was a jolt in the arm for the uh, rock and roll industry. It, it was literally a jolt in the arm, my <laughs> friend. Yeah. Right? You imagine? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was drugs and it was it was painful and it mm -hmm. was hard to watch uh, the collapse of, of Sex Pistols. And, and that was the last night, as you know. Right. But it was the beginning of many nights for other musicians. True. Because they opened a door that um, nobody's ever gone backwards into that room again because they, they simplified it. and and gave us such passion and stuff. And I loved Jonesy and I became really friendly with him and me and Miss Pamela had him. Um, he lived with us, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he lived with us and our newborn son. Oh, wow. And um, he was, he was uh, you know, a heroin addict at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'd gotten sober off heroin, oh, wow, about a couple of years mm -hmm. before I, I, saw, I met him. Uh, and, and that sort of rubbed off on him. And he's now 28 years sober, you know, Steve Jones. Yeah, bless his heart. But he's the greatest guitar player ever. I mean, he's I, really I, great. I, I you know, people don't realize. I picked up his guitar one night. We were somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And, uh, and I picked up that Les Paul, that white Les Paul. And, and I strummed it, and it didn't sound like Steve Jones. Yeah, so, you know, it right? is. And, and I really got that very that pure understanding of it's you, it's the, the, your life energy is in that fucking guitar, in it's your true. hands. Mm -hmm. And anybody can pick it up, but they're not going to sound like Steve Jones. And Clem Burke on drums, which was incredible. Shocking. You know, to have oh, those two so people He's a good playing dude. together yeah. Tony Sales from Tin Machine and uh, Nigel Harrison from Blondie. So you had Blondie's rhythm section, mm -hmm. Jonesy and, and me, and oh my That's God. A sick so lineup. live, it was great. Yeah. The record sucked, in my view. Mm. I shouldn't say that, but mm. we, 
you know, it was like a vibe where we really were a live band, but we were dancing on a tightrope because of the the narcotic use in that mm. band was really quite extensive. So therefore, we were very untrustworthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we wouldn't show up for those sessions, and, and the record suffered as a result of yeah. it. Some great songs, and we covered that song, Are You Sure Hank Done It This Way, that Waylon Jennings did. Great, great song. And when when the band was on, it was like the greatest rock band I was ever in. You know, but it changed so much yeah. because of the drug use. I say you're dirty and talk about Silverhead that's a band that uh, is not uh, as well known but yeah a lot of musicians do talk about I play records every day mm -hmm. you know on Little Steven's Underground Garage and what I've discovered is that the great band Velvet Underground New York Dolls replacements yeah. you know um, have s pistols did not sell records right but they again I think their power and strength was in their influence on, on a, a myriad of other bands the if Ramones, like for example, didn't really sell a lot no, of records. No, absolutely perfect example. No. But with the whole hair band thing, mm. really, I think, came from the Dolls, which came through Silverhead, which came, you know, yeah. the whole glam scene in sure. England in 72, and Mark and Bowie, you know. And, and Out the Hoople. Yes, and, and many more, Slade. Slade. You know. Um, so, no, there's a lot of bands that didn't, you know. Mm. And, uh, but... Uh, it's a and, and yet a lot of derivative bands were huge. Exactly, and, and that happens. Half the power or, or, or uh, songwriting ability right. or performing ability. But they had the look. A lot of times, it's yeah, it becomes they the had look, the look, baby, yeah, whatever. yeah. And they they're building on what you've already started. Oh, I hate to even think like that. Well, no, 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 no. So um, I let's did invest in hairspray. <laughs> As everybody Which made did. me a fortune, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about your acting career okay. because I don't think a lot of people really realize that you've appeared in quite a few Everything. things. Yeah. Give us Alf. a. <laughs> yeah, I worked with Alf. It was absolutely hysterical. It was fabulous. Loved it. What is it like interacting with a puppet? Do you find yourself talking exactly at the puppet? Uh, Hollywood is filled with puppets, my dear friend. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> so uh, I uh, listen, I don't give a fuck. If there's a camera on me, mm. I'll say the lines and take the check and go home and, you know, play guitar. Nice. No, but I mean, I've been amazingly lucky. When I played Murdoch, you know, because I'd just done Live Aid and, um, w and, you know, the band went its separate ways after that tour mm. that I did with uh, Power Station. Power Station, yeah. And, uh, and I, I went for an audition at Paramount and I remember I had a big white vintage Rolls Royce. <laughs> it was the most beautiful car you've ever seen. I was sitting in the back. I was so egoic and so filled with like, you know, this tour had made millions of dollars, you know, and it, it came out of the blue. Robert Palmer was the singer who I knew very well and love and right. brilliant artist, but they replaced him with me because Check had passed it open for Duran. Oh, that's right. So Duran, Andy said, okay, we'll get him. Jillian knows, she knows, she was there, she was watching. <laughs> she was a little baby watching the telly <laughs> when I come on in my Vivian Westwood white coat. You know. Oh, nice. But uh, it was such a trip, and, and I really was enjoying every second, man, because I'd already had two bands toured endlessly all around the world, you know, with very little to show for it other than a habit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and uh, married Miss Pamela. And Miss Pamela. Uh, you know, yes. but so they were going to Paramount in this lot. I got the job just driving past the fucking office. The, the MacGyver offices were right there on no Paramount way. lot. Yes, because I'm sitting in the back in all black leather, <laughs> and the white <laughs> rolls goes right, and the producers are screaming, 
Jesus Christ. Get that guy! <laughs> you know? And I, I literally got the job driving by. That's so and then they, what a great they found story. a parking spot, and I went in, and they go, oh, you've already got it. You know, I mean, they're like, here's the script. Read this. We're off to Vancouver to shoot it. And I, it was only one episode. Uh. Second season, and I ended up doing it for five years. How great is that? Though? It's great. And, and, uh, and that show actually has embedded itself into American culture oh, because, yeah, 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 now you talk about MacGyvering yes, something. It's right? literally in the encyclopedia, <laughs> MacGyverism. But now I'm on the reboot. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, the, it's, a, it's a funny story because the guy that they got to play, my original character, Murdoch, uh -huh. so the first, his first episode comes on in the first season of the reboot, uh -huh. Murdoch. Uh -huh. There's a new murder. People went insane with anger. Yeah. Fuck you. You can't have You suck. Else. You're not Murdoch. So what I did was I sent a tweet out right away that night. This guy's great. Love this guy. He's a tremendous actor. This is wonderful. Knowing full well right. that CBS would call my agents the next morning, <laughs> say, get him back. Let's put him back in this series, you know, and people went crazy, and, and I did, and I asked for an exorbitant amount of money and got it. Awesome. See, that's even better because... Well, it's, you know, it's all a game. Sure. It's all a big chess game. <laughs> in that whole world, you sure. know, theater, the theater. I'd done more. You did a lot of acting when I was a kid, yeah. yeah. Well, I did just so with Love and then uh, with Sidney Poitier, you know, and the kids, and, and that was, like, huge, and that made us really famous And, and the, in that time. This is 1966, and I was a teenager, but the thing is I got into every club, man, Yardbirds, Animals, Nashville Teens, Georgie Fame, John Mayle, Alexis Corner, The Rolling Stones, so many, Holly, Searchers, all of these bands I saw. You get to and, Hendrix. and Hendrix. Well, I just, you know, because we could go anywhere we wanted to come in, you know. And sure. So when the when you know when Jimmy first played, I was in drama school with a guy called Mitch Mitchell. Mitch Mitchell, who's drummer. Jimmy's drummer, yeah. and he says to me, "We're in a ballet class, and we're doing the ballet." And suddenly, uh, he goes, "Here, Michael, um, this uh, black fella." He's really good. He's left-handed. Come and see him play. That's how it happened. Wow. Yeah. You got to see that. And what well, I, yes. How astonishing that was that? Well, it was astonishing because the front row is Jeff Beck, Eric Clapson, Keith Richards, Pete Townsend. They're all in the club. Sure. Blazes, and it was called. And they're drooling. Because and they, they know they're weeping. Yeah. And all of them <laughs> the next day, go all of them the next day got perms. <laughs> Perm their fucking hair, cause yeah. Jimmy. Because it was so overwhelming yeah. when he came out there chewing gum and could care less what you thought. Right. And that stardom to me. Yeah. I'm 72 years old and I just got married to a 17 year old woman. <laughs> girl. But she's really smart. She's really smart, yeah. yeah. She's not. Yeah, yeah. But she, she's really smart, but she's not 17. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it is my third wife. Of course, my, uh, my second wife, Pamela, is just... Uh, I'm reading her book right now. Dig it. That yeah. book is on Netflix. It is. Last week, she signed a deal with Netflix to do the I'm With the Band as a series. Whoa, that's cool. No shit. That's going to be amazing, yeah, because, yeah. uh, man, she talks about everybody in that book. Well, I mean, she met so many people. But the, the, the best people. Sure. Everybody. The best bodies. Sure. It's really a, an astonishing and read. I loved it. I loved her even before I met her because... I, any woman, mm -hmm. and Jillian will attest to this, that this is not a, a man's world. Mm -hmm. It's a man and woman's world. We're, it's equal. So Pamela was one of the first people to really, I think, even though it might sound peculiar, I believe she was at the forefront of a feminist movement that, that began young women from all of Duluth, Minnesota to Hollywood to understand that they could go and get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Like men, I'm going to do like this and do this. Well, that she did that, but in a blissful, sure. you know, beaded... Girls, girls together style. outrageously, right? right? Girls together outrageously, and Zappa loved them. Yes. And Rod and um, Lowell George and Beck all played on the GTOs, right? Yeah. Record. 
you Some know, amazing people Zappa were. produced, and and they had deep respect for Miss Pamela. But you know what happened was that it was such a tsunami of uh, criticism from various women writers, intellectuals mm. like Gloria Steinem, mm. who at the time was a bunny. I know, isn't that funny? <laughs> and said that Pamela was, you know, a slut and all yeah. this. And of course, I went crazy when I heard this and uh, tried to seek her out and set her straight. And I wrote a, l a bunch of things for Cree Magazine about the absurd, ironic hypocrisy sure. of these women yeah. who, like Gloria Steinem, who were at, uh, ostensibly point, yeah. point fingers, uh, you know, ostensibly Feminist. part of a feminist movement. Yeah, and Miss really. Powell was actually doing what they were fucking writing about, so fuck off. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, your association with these fine people and well, Die you know, Laughing. It's, it's great. I adore Die Laughing Records. I think they're the absolute best punk label. They've got the best bands. They they treat them with uh, respect. They are treated with respect by the bands. When did that last happen? <laughs> the movies that you've been in that maybe people well, the, the, my favorite movie I was in was a little scene movie called The Man from Elysian Fields that uh -huh. that starred Mick Jagger, James Coburn, Andy Garcia um, and uh, it was an amazing movie and it, uh, it was beautiful it was about a, um, a, a writer who'd lost his touch and became a gigolo right and I was this sort of aging gigolo and Mick was the uh, owned the whole gigolo thing oh, I see. and it was great the one story I'll tell you about it is pretty interesting when we were doing the table read with the script yeah. Mick came in and it was Mick Jagger now obviously if you Mick Jagger walks into a room you know that no. room is electric I mean sure. people just don't know how to behave right. they just don't so the director who didn't give a shit about any of that right. went over to him and put his fingers in his hair, in his bangs, uh -huh. and pushed it off his face. Uh -huh. And suddenly there was another person sitting there. Whoa. Right? So Jagger played it all with his hair back, completely different from, you know, uh, from Ch Mick. Changed yeah. his whole Changed, finger. yes, by simply pushing his hair up his face. Interesting. It was no longer Jumping Jack Flash. Right. And I just, I watched this go down. And that you must have been transfixed. I was absolutely hypnotized by this m miraculous moment of, 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 you know, Mick Jack has to live up to a lot of oh, stuff. God, I yeah. mean, you can imagine, but he never traveled with bodyguards. He would show up, get in his trailer, he'd know everybody's lines, and his own, obviously, uh -huh. and come out and just kill, kick ass, a couple of takes, and he always did everything very fast. He would walk back to the trailer fast, he'd go, to the, you know, drive himself. Now, the majority of rock and roll stars that I've been around right. are carried. Yes, they're, they're you know, by four girls yeah. or handlers. Or the handlers, yeah, and and he was just that's not who he is, you know. That's why he stayed. That's why I always say longevity is the new black. <laughs> What do you think is uh, see as your future in terms of as acting and as uh, in music? I don't look at the future at all. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've got too much to do tonight, mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I go back, um, you know, I don't know. Things just happen. I don't really plan too much. 
I am going to do keep doing MacGyver. I know that um, because I'm contracted to CBS to do so. Mm -hmm. I know that I want to keep writing. I worked this last month with. Um, I wrote a song with Susie Quattro, uh, which who I love, who yes. sang on Silver Records, you yeah. know. And I was produced by Stephen Van Zandt. I, d I did two songs with Stephen in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm writing with Kevin Preston from the band Prima Donna. Oh yeah, Prima Donna, I know this guy. Terrific guys. band, and he's yeah, a great are. Band. He's actually the guitar player in Green Day in the new tour. Oh, I didn't know that. B Billy's just gonna jump around, and, and Kevin, great guitar player, terrific writer, and I've just been writing with a lot of people. I did a duet with Genya Raven, you might recall, sort of a Bonnie Bramlett type singer from the late 60s, mm. Br great R&B voice, and I did a duet with her, which I wrote, called Where Did All The Lovers Go? <laughs> People go to find out more about the uh, your radio show. On well, they go to Sirius XM Channel 21 in mm -hmm. Little Stevens Underground Garage. It's on every day, three hours somewhere time zone in San Francisco. It's 9 p.m. to midnight mm -hmm. every day, Monday through Friday. In New York, it's 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. And um, you know, I'm on MacGyver. I've got to spend the mistakes. I have. Um, you know, a, a very wide and varied future, and I won't stop for one second to think how good I'm doing it or how bad I'm doing it. I'll just do it. Say no more. <laughs>